Hello, Mark Palmer. I'm city engineer for the city of Puyallup. Um, been in charge of the CIP program for the city of Puyallup and the LID efforts with the city of Puyallup. Uh, city of Puyallup's been recognized as a leader in development of LID and porous pavements and porous asphalt in particular and porous asphalt design and construction is what I'll be here to discuss with you today. Some of the things that we will be discussing are the materials and specifications that are peculiar to porous asphalt pavement, uh, the performance overall of permeable asphalt, some emerging green technologies that we could utilize uh, when employing porous asphalt, and uh, time for questions at the end. We've got a lot of the performance go goals that are related to uh, porous asphalt. Uh, we obviously want to properly integrate the entire site grading into the design. We want to have a permeable wearing course that allows the water to flow through. It is a flexible pavement section, but it needs to be designed to withstand saturated subgrade conditions. The pavement should be designed to infiltrate 100% of the rainfall that lands upon its surface. The pavement depth should be sufficient to eliminate frost heave in areas where there's a frost concern. And I'm highlighting that it should be a durable, long-lasting wearing course. In the early stages of porous asphalt, we focused on making sure that the water is able to get through the asphalt. And that's actually a natural tendency of asphalt in general. Uh, but we've done that at the expense of creating a durable, long-lasting pavement. Uh, so a lot of the last iterations and changes in porous asphalt specification and design has come in trying to make sure it's a durable, long-lasting pavement as well as be permeable. Talk about the construction sequencing and some of the unique aspects of uh, sequencing porous asphalt pavement. Preventing or accounting for surface water run-on, which is actually a key element here. Surface water run-on can be a severe detriment to porous pavements. In line with that, providing a redundancy and making sure that we have a way for water to get in and out of the pavement in case there's too much water in the subgrade or we have uh, water that is on a failed pavement and it still allows it to get in the subgrade and infiltrate. Also a consideration is now we're putting a lot of water under the subgrade and want to consider where that flow may actually go and trenches are a concern so that's something we need to consider and, and take into account in our designs. One of the things is that porous asphalt has always been considered a, a good use for parking lots and low volume uses. However, porous asphalt has been used in high volume roads as shown in the example here from a road in Arizona, SR87. Uh, the pavement on the left is regular HMA pavement. The right is uh, porous asphalt pavement. Uh, you notice there's not a lot of visual difference, but it is a porous pavement. It is on obviously a high volume road and actually uh, over the course of five years it performed well and maintained design infiltration rates over that period. Uh, it also had some other benefits they weren't expecting and the fact that it does reduce glare by not having water on the surface and it shows the stripe and delineation better during rain events. So as we mentioned it's good for local roads, parking lots, and trails. Uh, parking lots are actually a fairly tough test because of the low speed turning motions that have a tendency to want to ravel of uh, the pavement uh, with the wheels trying to turn at low or no speed. We want to resist the temptation to mix porous with impermeable pavements in the same section. Uh, and that's again mainly due to that run-on issue. Uh, run-on is almost always going to be carrying sediment and other contaminants with it. It's one of the main reasons we're using porous pavement is to try to prevent that from happening. But if we have impervious pavements adjacent to it, it does carry those onto the porous pavement and it will tend to capture those in the top layers and eventually clog it without uh, additional maintenance above and beyond what you normally would do. Depth of section can be an issue on high volume roads. Uh, you can consider using pervious concrete to avoid existing utilities and for the life cycle cost advantages that provides. Um, you can thin the porous asphalt sections of these high volume roads by using asphalt treated base which we now recommend instead of using a choker course of rock in order to have a more stable platform for your asphalt pavers but also to provide additional structural strength to the pavement section and geogrid can also help thin your porous asphalt section and get it more competitive uh, with concrete on higher volume roads. So since we're talking the to topic on uh, per porous asphalt versus pervious concrete uh, there are some distinct differences, not necessarily pros and cons, but differences between the two. Porous asphalt installs almost identically to a regular HMA pavement. It doesn't require a certified installer. 
not just any normal paver can complete the job. Uh, in fact, we're making that process closer and closer to the, the same process. Uh, porous asphalt, however, cannot be made in small batches. Uh, requires a large plant changeover. I've been told anywhere between 40 to 80 tons might be a minimum order for a porous asphalt in order to get it done. Uh, comparatively, pervious concrete can be done per truckload per the size that you need it. On inst installation, going back to that step, uh, pervious concrete does require certified installers. The process for placing pervious concrete is completely different than placing uh, standard concrete and is a process that needs to be adhered to uh, rigidly or else you can have issues with the pervious concrete installation. As we mentioned before, high volume roads, pervious concrete may be more cost effective both in the short term cost and life cycle cost of the project, primarily due, due to the nature of the thickness of the pavement required of a flexible pavement on a saturated subgrade. Porous asphalt can be used almost immediately. Uh, we usually recommend that you stay off it for 24 hours or so and allow it to stabilize and cool. However, you can be on it almost immediately versus uh, need a full seven day cure for pervious concrete. As already mentioned, the uh, porous asphalt requires a thicker section for higher volume roads or poor roads or poor soils. Uh, a committee has been developed to develop a wash dot specification for porous asphalt. Uh, Jessica Knickerbocker at City of Tacoma is lead on that. At this time, these specifications have actually been published and are now available as WASHDOT APWA specifications, and it does cover not only porous asphalt, but pervious concrete and permeable pavers, as well as the rock aggregate subgrade treatment and other requirements of porous pavement installation. The specification draft form was at the City of Tacoma's website, but there's now, again, a current Washington State APWA amendment and is available in the general special provision section. So keep in mind that the porous asphalt specification that we're talking about here is based on a Western Washington Puget Sound basin. Your binder may need to be modified somewhat, generally up from 7022 to 7622 or even higher, depending on where your project is located. Uh, we will focus on asphalt present the pavement for this presentation and not the subgrade site prep and aggregates. There's a lot of details involved in that in the installation of porous pavements that are different than standard HMA or concrete pavements, but we're going to focus on just the asphalt aspects at this in this presentation. Some of the specification partners, just so you see who is involved, uh, covered the gamut of suppliers, uh, contractors, uh, municipalities, testing agencies, and consultants. Uh, was a very broad-based committee and actually did very very good work over two years to come up with this uh, set of standard specifications. So what have we determined? Porous asphalt mix design, some of the key components here is that we're going to use a, a class half inch HMA PG7022 polymer modified asphalt. Uh, the polymer modified asphalt is important in that it allows the asphalt to stay adhered better to the aggregate We've got less fines to hold the asphalt up or into the aggregate, uh, so we need something that's going to hold on uh, and, and keep it adhered to that rock and not drain down, and the polymer seems to make a huge difference in that. We also want to have a higher asphalt cement content, somewhere between 6 and 7 percent by total weight of the asphalt mix, and this again is primarily to help make a more durable pavement, keep the asphalt up there. It's the glue that holds everything together. If we start losing it, then the pavement itself begins to unravel. So we're trying to keep uh, the asphalt content, the asphalt in the rock and keep it up there where it can keep things glued together. The void ratio we're looking for is between 16 and 25 percent at a 75 gyration compaction after. Uh, again, that's that void ratio that gives a free draining material. Uh, but again, we want to focus less on that and more on the, the durability aspects of the porous asphalt pavement. Standard gradation is in the standard spec that has been approved. It does allow for modifications because we use the combination of two other specs that were available out there. Uh, give a little wider range, still gives you the permeability you need, uh, but gives you enough structure as well. The two-phase fracture requirement is another thing to allow more interlocking of the aggregate to allow it to uh, support more weight and resist rutting.
some things can happen if you do have a, a gradation issue, and this is on a Chova course at a, a project site in Tumwater, Washington, uh, where we had an aggregate that was all of one size, virtually all of it, and you can see this is just pickup truck ruts uh, coming in and significantly displacing this rock, and that's because it didn't have anything at all to interlock with. It was just all like a bunch of marbles. When we corrected the mix and added a more diverse uh, gradation of rock, the other rock is still down. We just mixed it with some of the material that's shown here, uh, and it held up fairly well. We can go over trophy core specification uh, here, but I'm not going to go over it in great detail because I think we've since superseded this with the use of porous asphalt treated base. Uh, but you do want to be careful that you watch your specifications on uh, choker course if you use it and on your aggregate course for your uh, aggregate for your your asphalt and as you can see here the red line is showing what was submitted and obviously falling well outside the dash lines here which were the specification substitute rock was within the specification except at the very top end here uh, and it did perform much better. So porous asphalt treated base is a, a good alternative and actually a very highly recommended alternative to a Choco course. Uh, not only it provides you a much more stable base for your wearing course installation when you have asphalt pavers and dump trucks on it. Uh, when you have a, no matter how good your Choco course is, you're going to have a lot of uh, movement on that. You're going to have to have rollers out there constantly working that to try to keep it smooth enough so you get an even application of asphalt over top of that, uh, the asphalt treated base virtually eliminates that. It can actually allow for stage construction. You could allow some traffic on there as long as you're making sure that you got your equipment or what traffic is on there is clean so you don't clog your, your, your pavement, uh, but you could have it uh, staged and allow some traffic on it uh, before you put the actual final wearing course down. Uh, obviously, it provides more structural strength than the aggregate itself. Uh, the aggregate, especially since it is loosely uh, interlocking, doesn't provide a lot of structural strength. The asphalt-treated base is almost like another layer of asphalt. Applications not only included on Tacoma website, but they are a Washington State uh, APWA GSP. So we mentioned uh, a porous asphalt mix design, the air voids of 16 to 25% by ASTM D3203. Drain down, which is not necessarily accurate reflection, of what's happening in the field, but it's basically the only test we have now. We'd like to see a better drain down test done. It's done by uh, ASTM 6390 and only 0.3% maximum is supposed to come out of the, the tray on that one at 15 degrees above the design mix temperature. Uh, Oregon Department of Transportation has an alternative test me measure, which is more like a Rorschach test where they place it on a piece of paper and you estimate how much of the paper is covered by the asphalt that falls out of it. That's you know, it's pretty subjective test um, wouldn't necessarily recommend that. If you're having difficulties with uh, drain down in your mix you might want to consider adding a, a uh, Kevlar fiber or other similar fiber to your mix design which will help take up uh, provide more surface area for the asphalt to adhere to. Uh, also warm mix has been showing to be a very good measure for preventing drain down. The lower temperature of the asphalt is allowing it to stay on the rock better than uh, having it at the higher temperatures, it also seems to place better. So warm mix uh, seems to be a way to go. In fact, uh, the city of Puyallup will be doing warm mix on future porous asphalt projects. Uh, as a field check for that, you'll want to check and watch for asphalt in the beds of dump trucks to uh, see if you're getting a lot of asphalt liquid in the bottom of your trucks. If you are, then you need to stop and readjust your mix and, and try to start again. Just so you see what that one drain down test looks like, uh, basically they obviously carefully weigh everything uh, to the point of, uh, in some cases, making sure you're just dripping the asphalt off in here to make sure you've got the exact right amount. Mix it up almost like cake mix, put it in this container here, put it in the oven, cook it at that 315 or at 15 degrees above uh, the design temperature and then you look to see what actually drops out and this was an actual test that passed but just barely you can see it wouldn't take a whole lot of uh, material in order to not pass that test. This is the Rorjak like test I mentioned that uh, ODOT does 
and you basically count how or you figure out by estimating a percentage comparing it to these they have several different charts that you can look at to see which your test co most closely resembles as far as coverage of asphalt. Our guidance on anti-stripping agent is if the supplier normally uses anti-stripping in their normal HMA mixes, they should use it in their porous HMA. Uh, shouldn't exceed 1% of weight by their aggregates. If you're having difficulty meeting that 6% uh, asphalt in the design mix due to drain down, again, consider increasing your fines in the aggregate. Again, we're working more for that durability of the pavement, less than being concerned about the porosity of the pavement. Uh, over time, asphalt is going to start to leak on its own without any assistance. So, you know, you can increase the fines a little bit to get there. I'll give you more surface area, and fibers will do the same thing. They'll give you more um, surface area. They also may additional create some additional strength and connections uh, with the, the strength of the fiber. And again, just a reminder, we're trying to shoot for that durable and long-lasting uh, pavement, and that's why we're using that polymer modified 7022. So we mentioned uh, GeoGrid as being a way to um, thin the section, and what we're showing here is a pavement section from uh, a project that's going to go uh, in here in the next six months or so in the city of Puyallup. Uh, it's our WSU LID frontage project. Um, we have, and this is an arterial, and we're using porous asphalt instead of concrete in this particular reason. Uh, we've got a five foot layer of peat about 13 feet down, and we did not want to place a rigid pavement over differentially setting, settling soil such as that. So we are going to use porous asphalt on this, but to thin the section up, uh, we have used the GeoGrid on here. You install that per the manufacturer's recommendation, and you can get a, a reduction in uh, structural strength. GeoGrid's uh, noted here on the plans and uh, up here on this section itself. Uh, we're also using the asphalt treated permeable base again for the same two reasons that it's going to thin our section down and it's also going to provide us uh, a more stable platform for doing our asphalt paving. So when you're doing pavement section design uh, it needs to take into account basically three different factors. Uh, one would be frost heave, and for us in the Puget Sound Basin, that's only about one foot of depth, so it's usually not a consideration since most of your, your porous asphalt sections are going to be about a foot or more in depth anyway. Um, it needs to have sufficient hydrology to allow the water to infiltrate before the next storm, so your reservoir course needs to be deep enough to hold the water uh, that's going to stand and not infiltrate until the soil can take it. And generally, again, in the Puget Sound Basin, a uh, 100-year storm for us is a 4-inch in 24 hours. Uh, so if you think about it, if you have even a quarter inch per hour, you're not going to need a lot of storage space. So that usually does not rule as far as the structural pavement design. Structural design, however, does because you need to distribute the load over what are assumed saturated poor soils because you are allowing the water in, contrary to conventional pavement design of, of standard HMA pavements. So structural almost always rules uh, when it comes to porous asphalt section design. There's a lot of different ways we can go about this. There's some guidelines that can be used. WashDOT has some pavement design software called Everstress, um, which unfortunately I have not been able to get to function on my computer. WAPA, which is the Washington Asphalt Pavement Association, has a program can, that you can use called Pavement Express, and the link is shown here. Um, there's also just some rough guidelines on uh, flexible pavement thickness design as a guideline using uh, equivalent single axle loads as your measure of how heavy the loads are being used. Uh, I would always assume that the uh, subgrade condition is poor and then uh, choose your HMA surface and stone accordingly. So here we'd have a quarter foot of asphalt uh, with 85 hundredths of a foot of stone depth or structural on something less than 100,000 easels. Uh, and that would be a very low, low, low volume road. And as you can see, generally, even, even at this low, low volume road, you're going to be over a foot in depth. So again, the frost heave depth does not usually come into play on structural design. Another uh, guideline here is for a little bit higher volume roads, uh, up to 5 million and over easels. Uh, there's some pavement thicknesses here that can apply uh, as a guideline if you'd like to use those. And then finally, there's actually some washed out permeable pavement 
recommended thicknesses here for low volume, and which is the primary use that Washdot Washdot is using it for. And just as an example, we can show what's at the WSU LID center. This is what we designed for that section. Again, this is on poor till soils, poorly draining, uh, to the order of three thousandths of an inch per hour draining. Uh, there we're using 18 inches of aggregate and 2 inches of choker. However, the 2 inch choker was not used. Uh, it was determined that the aggregate base was sufficient to support the asphalt pavers. So the choker course was just converted to aggregate discharge base for 20 inches total over 3 inches of porous asphalt. A non-woven pavement was put down in this place and at this time non-woven is, is considered optional at this point. Uh, and in most cases it's not required. Uh, also the uh, specifications you'll know that are now out and published don't show compacting the subway to 92 percent. Uh, we just show a firm and unyielding subway condition. For construction, uh, sequencing is important. You need to plan your site work to keep the construction traffic off your subgrade uh, and this is at subgrade not uh, your native grades. One example has been to excavate the subgrade is moving out and backfill aggregate from the opposite end. Uh, this has worked well in, in many projects. You do need to consider utility construction and make sure that if you have utility construction you don't place your rock obviously before you uh, do your utility construction you need to get all that done first. If you have significant utility construction you may want to actually do all that before you do any excavation of taking the road down to subgrade or at least take subgrade down to uh, six inches or more above final subgrade so that you're not uh, compacting the uh, subgrade as you go through and work on that. Once you've got the reservoir rock down uh, you can compact that and allow traffic on the rock. Obviously you want to keep the traffic uh, clean. You don't want a bunch of dirty tired truck vehicles going across that but uh, it can go across that. Uh, reservoir rock without any problem. Uh, depending on how well graded your reservoir rock is, you may have some difficulty with vehicles moving on that. Uh, if it's got a lot of rock of one size, it can tend to uh, sink vehicles. So uh, hopefully you've got a, a rock that's got a little bit varied gradation so that you don't have uh, an unstable surface. Uh, as I mentioned, if you don't have asphalt treated base, you're likely going to need rollers around to fix and compact the rock as the pavers are working because any turning motion uh, on this particular rock that doesn't lock up really well, uh, is, you're going to have to have rollers out there almost all the time. So when you're looking at the asphalt itself, look for the aggregate to be porous. You don't want sheen or sealed off areas or smooth black areas. You know, you're not looking for that. Uh, but having said that, again, normally porous asphalt has an initial installation uh, infiltration rate of between 350 to 700 inches an hour. Uh, that's far more than you're ever going to need in any storm in any area. Um, so if it's not widespread, don't be too concerned about it. Small sealed off areas are not a, a cause for concern. If you're getting large areas that are sealed off, then you do need to start to be concerned. Before your rock is placed, make sure your subgrade has not been compacted, and that's going to be the one that's going to be a bit difficult if you're taking it down to subgrade a little too early. Uh, the temptation for people to get on it and start traveling on it is going to be great. However, if you just go through and scarify that an inch or two deep before placing your rock, uh, you should be fine. Again, we mentioned watching for asphalt and abandoned delivery trucks. That will indicate your drain down issue. One thing that would be key is the uh, Asphalt does need to be rolled when it's in the correct temperature range and your asphalt supplier will be providing you with the correct temperature range to compact your, um, your mix and make sure that it's uh, done at the correct temperature too early and you risk uh, sealing it up uh, too late and you're going to have probably an uneven surface and not a well compacted surface that's going to be subject to uh, degradation uh, quicker than it should be, uh, shortened life expectancy. We have established now that a target compaction should be 80 to 85 percent of the maximum rice density. Again, that's again getting to that durability goal, focusing less on the porosity of the, the pavement and more on the durability. That has been a measure that we haven't had in the past, and this could be used with your normal nuclear densometer, so we can 
have something now to target out there when we're looking at compaction instead of just sticking our thumb to the wind on that. So again, observation keys, make sure things are not sealed and compacted off. You can see here we've got puddles uh, showing that this area is sealed off on the subgrade, whereas over here it's very loose and uh, free draining. Here we're showing the back dump uh, sequencing uh, in the upper thing. This has all been excavated out in this direction, and now we're backfilling with gravel or reservoir rock going back in this direction, just back dump it here. And then the grader comes out and pushes across. And from here on, you can be traveling across this. You've got, in this case, about 12 inches of depth, uh, more than enough to uh, prevent compaction of the subgrade. This is kind of what your shoulder ballast or reservoir course should look like. Uh, should be clean, should be fractured. You, know, you want to definitely get, want the fractured. Uh, it should be kind of loose in place. So this is a good compare and contrast uh, between two. Um, this cell over here is porous. This is the porous test section for the WSU site. This is a standard dense uh, crush surfacing top course, which you can see has a closed off look. You can't even see a lot of uh, rocks or so much uh, planar material in between where you have that complete absence of it here. This is a control section for the WSU uh, that was done with standard pavement. Similarly, we have the same situation here. Uh, again, you can see this sealed off area. There's a lot of fines on top uh, all the way down here. Uh, one of the earlier projects where I was talked into using cross servicing base course uh, as a porous surfacing material. And in this particular case, you can see it really wasn't terribly porous. Uh, should look more like the material down here. Uh, even though this still has quite a bit of fines adhering to the rock, there's also quite a bit of free pore space here that allows the choker course to be free, free draining. So this is kind of a little test. If you can look at these two, which one of these would not be acceptable based on what you've learned thus far. And if you take a close look here, the one thing you should observe here is you really don't see any rocks of a differing size. This is almost entirely 3 8 inch rock. There's nothing in between. There's no bigger rock. There's no smaller rock. And this is basically the rock that was in that first picture I showed you of the significant running. And this is the rock that replaced it. It looks dirtier, but it, and it does have more fines, but it also has a lot different. They have small rocks here, large rocks there, and a lot of stuff in between. So this, this binds up much better, but it's still free draining. As we mentioned already, make sure the compaction starts within the specified compaction range. One of those things we have learned again with the warm mix is that you do get a wider range of uh, compaction temperature, which allows you more time to do the compaction. Uh, but again, we don't want to have uh, either too early or too late on the compaction effort. And the city of Tacoma, city of Puyallup did comparisons on percent dry density versus voids on some of our porous asphalt pavements. And it's how we derive that we should be at the 80 to 85 percent maximum rice density for our um, density specification. So again, these are those same two cells that we looked at in the gravel situation. And looking at the observation keys, you can see the porous asphalt does look slightly different than the dense graded over here. Uh, you can see actually the dense graded has a lot of dirt on it. But and as we mentioned, the poor a pavement asphalt typically likes to leak. Uh, well, in this particular case, we're trying to get their control storm off the regular HMA pavement, but it was proving to be too porous. So they actually had to go out and put enough dirt on here to clog it up so that they actually could get runoff off of it for the test. So even our non-porous non HMA was so porous that we had to actually dirty it up to get it to clog up a little bit. So placement and acceptance, uh, the specification now is saying for both concrete and asphalt that you should average over 100 inches per hour. Um, as already mentioned, you know, 375 inches an hour to 750 is a normal standard for asphalt. 
So you should easily make that uh, standard. If you're not making that standard, there's, there's something wrong. Uh, even with that, uh, you know, an inch per hour would be more than adequate to pass all the rainfall that's going to hit it in almost any state in the Union. Uh, so that would be a judgment call on your part as far as acceptance of that material. However, if you have white, you only do this in small areas, and if you're not passing that test, you may want to do more extensive tests to see if it's consistent throughout the entire project area. Um, City of Tacoma and Puyallup are going to continue testing porous pavements to verify the density range for porous asphalt as we do more projects in our respective cities. Uh, when you're out looking at your project, look for sealed off areas, but again, only if there's extensive areas out there would remedial action really be required. Just some quick post-construction notes. You're handing porous pavements off to owners. They really need to be aware of what they have. Uh, in this case, this used to be a porous asphalt driveway, and I, you know what I say used to be? You can kind of see this little black edge all along here. Well, somebody came along and told this person that their driveway was leaking badly, so they took that porous asphalt driveway and put a seal coat on it. So this is pretty much no longer a porous asphalt driveway. Home ownership education or owner education or covenants that travel the land would be important to keep that happening. Uh, information such as this can be helpful where you just have a sign that uh, indicates it's porous pavement and that you know you shouldn't it's managing stormwater, dump no waste, drains to your groundwater. Uh, this is that same Tumwater site uh, where the porous asphalt was installed. Maintenance on porous asphalt is typically just a regular sweeping with a regenerative air or vacuum sweeper. Uh, City of Puyallup has one of the most aggressive street sweeping programs that I've found in the state and maybe <laughs> uh, throughout the country uh, where we have regenerative air sweepers and we sweep our streets, all streets in the city, at least once a month. Uh, and some more frequently than that. So we get regular street sweeping on our normal streets. We don't treat our porous streets any differently than that, and we uh, allow them to, or just uh, to sweep them on our normal rotation for streets. If you really want to be uh, green on these, obviously there's alternative fuel options available on these generative air sweepers, so you can be even a little bit more green if you'd like to. So other issues post-construction is protection of the pavement during building construction. A lot of times uh, on new plats and, and green uh, greenfield construction, uh, the streets and, and pavement are put in first, and then the houses are built. And then you have to worry about all the house builders and the landscapers, and what are they doing with their materials? Are they washing off concrete trucks in the street? Are they uh, putting their landscaping materials on the street? Uh, so keeping care of that is an important issue. Home Homeowner end user care, uh, if you've got all these homeowners along this porous pavement street, do they understand that it is the stormwater system and that they shouldn't be washing off dirty trailers or, or putting their bark out in the street or doing things like that on the pavement? Make sure that they're aware of it. Obviously, you need to educate maintenance personnel and make sure you have a good inventory of any porous streets that you might have. So. It doesn't become a part of your chip seal program and you overlay or chip seal your formerly porous street or do a seal coat similar to what the driveway we just saw earlier. This may call for some different policies on utility installations and roadway repairs. Uh, as I mentioned, you have excessive uh, amounts of infiltration capacity uh, available on porous asphalt. Um, and we also mentioned, at least for now, why it's not the standard asphalt pavement out there and you have to switch over batch plants, um, you probably can't get it in small batches so that makes utility patches somewhat problematic. So again, keeping those two things in mind that you have excess capacity and you can't get small batches probably could allow up to you know, 20 to 30 percent of your roadway to become uh, non-porous patches if needed and not be terribly concerned about infiltration. Again, you're going to start getting little bits of run on from those patches, but those should be relatively small and insignificant. Uh, for previous concrete, it'll be a different uh, thing where you probably will have to do complete uh, roadway or uh, section removal and repair. So just going quickly, Sue's the myth busters. Uh, that's what I like to call them because there's, there's a lot of misinformation out there about porous pavements. 
um, porous pavements will clog over time. Uh, quite frankly, if you do get a lot of sediments on them, uh, they can become clogged, but they can also be rehabilitated fairly quickly. Uh, maintain, make sure you don't have that run on to the pavement is very key. And one of the key points here is that uh, the initial installation by the Environmental Protection Agency in 1977 at Walden Pond is still functioning. Uh, the SR87 project we showed earlier was in use for at least 20 years. There's been many, many installations of porous parking lots on the East Coast by Cahill Associates that have uh, continued to be uh, porous and functioning. Again, the use of regenerative vacuums can periodically uh, restore pavements to infiltration rates that installation are higher. And there are, with the increase in use of porous pavements, uh, more devices and, and uh, types of equipment that are being developed in order to rehabilitate porous pavements. Uh, porous asphalt will rut under traffic loads. If we properly design the structural strength of the pavement using the assumption that we've got a poor subgrade, uh, the roadway section will support itself. And further, the actual structural strength of the porous asphalt itself has been shown to be equivalent in uh, California and Oregon studies. Uh, and one of the things we've been doing incorrectly in the past on a lot of porous pavement mixes is we've not been calling for enough compaction. We've been telling people don't vibratory roll it, only roll it two or three times. Well, that was over concern on trying to keep the porous asphalt permeable when actually we should have been worried more about keeping it durable. And by doing the uh, compaction to the 80 to 85 percent, we're getting it where it needed to be. It's, it's got the rock and the, agri or the asphalt pushed together as far as it can while still being porous, which will keep it in, in a more durable con configuration and prevent that running from happening. Will lead to the pollution of groundwater. Uh, and again, this is one of the ones that we haven't had con concisively agreed to uh, yet, uh, but there's definitely been a lot of study and initial studies at WSU is showing that the porous asphalt itself is actually a good treatment medium and remove 80% percent or more of total suspended solids, which meets the basic water quality treatment criteria. Um, further than that, uh, once you get down to the soil interface, pollutants and hydrocarbons tend to be eaten up by microbes down in those areas, and there's, there's good studies to follow that up. Uh, from a water quality standpoint, uh, porous pavements really do a great job. As kind of evidentiary uh, example of that, uh, while this is pervious concrete, the EcoStorm Plus treats stormwater with pervious concrete filter. And this has been general use uh, approved uh, for stormwater quality basic treatment in Washington State. Another myth is that porous pavements are going to be prohibitively expensive. Uh, the porous asphalt itself is about 20% more than HMA. An example of a, a 2010 example is, is shown here, what that, that cost differential is. If you think about it, that's about the cost differential at the time of one two cartridge storm filter, which you would need at least one of those on that same parking lot, um, as well as the catch basins and the pipes and uh, everything to get to it, and probably a detention or retention pond on top of that. Um, there's a little bit more depth of ballast and geotextiles on porous pavement, so that adds a little bit of the cost of the porous pavement. But if you're going to eliminate all those catch basins, pipe, water quality treatment devices, storm ponds, and the real estate that goes with the storm ponds, uh, you are very likely going to be saving money rather than spending extra money on porous pavement, particularly in uh, where you have strict MPDS stormwater rules, uh, which most of the country does. Here's some more general information on the cost of the 8th Avenue Northwest project, which was the first LID street in the, the city of Puyallup. Um, gives you some of the information on the cost per ton. Basically placed 480 tons of asphalt in this site, and we actually had all versions of permeable on this. We had the pervious concrete sidewalks, uh, permeable paper sidewalks, and rain gardens on this site as well. Um, so including all that, uh, the whole cost of the project, uh, 600 feet long, was $369,000. $369, this is the information sheet for that, and you can see the, the street. Um, this is 8th Avenue Northwest. Um, it's curvilinear for traffic calming concerns. Uh, it's also a narrower street based on LID principles. 
uh, but it's all porous asphalt street uh, and the south sidewalk is pervious concrete, the north sidewalk is uh, permeable pavers. So there are other benefits of porous asphalt pavement. Um, reducing spray on higher speed roads is one of those and this is if you're a Washington native, this looks familiar, but this is actually a Texas site. You'd, this is the spray you'd get on a normal HA Mary Road on the same freeway where there's a porous pavement friction course installed in the same event. That's what you get for road spray. So it's pretty dramatic. Um, reduction of hydroplaning. Obviously, if you don't have the water on the surface of the asphalt, uh, you'll have less hydroplaning and sliding uh, on that surface. As you already mentioned from the Arizona study, there's a reduction of glare, so you're able to see the lane markers and other uh, pavement markings much easier. Uh, you don't have to buy additional right-of-way for additional stormwater control features such as detention retention ponds and water quality treatment structures. Uh, at least initially, there's a reduced tire noise from porous pavements. They are quieter pavement, and that's one of the reasons they were first used on freeways is to reduce tire noise. And again, maybe less costly than an overall road system, particularly taking into account the reduced stormwater infrastructure required. Nor New the University of New Hampshire has shown that there can be a reduction in salt application uh, required on porous paved roads. And again, we're preventing, preventing pollution by eliminating the surface runoff to begin with and allowing all that sediment and debris to be transported into our storms, lakes, and rivers. As we mentioned, warm mix is uh, a promising technology and actually has uh, been used at least a couple times in Tacoma and we'll be using it here in Puyallup uh, this summer. Basically, you're mixing the uh, asphalt well below the temperatures of hot mix. Hot mix is generally mixed around 315 degrees, which is close to the boiling point of a lot of the uh, materials in asphalt, which you know results in a big, um, as you can see here, you've got a big vapor cloud coming off of this plant, same plant mixing warm mix, it's non-existent. Uh, you don't see that there, and that is because you're not mixing it up to that uh, that vapor temperature. Also, you end up uh, working uh, the workers in less dangerous uh, circumstances. They're going to be uh, working on a cooler pavement, and it, it does allow for a longer uh, compaction time and a longer haul distance. Uh, and generally just it's more workable for a porous pavement as well. So that's what I have. Um, my contact information is here. I do endeavor to help jurisdictions and people utilizing porous asphalt and pervious concrete, uh, particularly in public roadway sections, but private development projects as well and help people as much as I can. Uh, if you want to contact me there, that's I'm available uh, for technical assistance anytime. And hope this was a good presentation and you got something out of it. Thank you.